So here we are, season two. Um, let's see. So we didn't actually do a big season finale closer. Uh, so we could do a big invasion, like like a whole season of the Borg and a build up. To, uh, yeah, actually, no, that'll never work. We'll just have a writer strike. Okay, let's have. Um, I've got it. Let's do basically everything we did in season one, but worse in every way. No, no, that that that's a really dumb idea. Um, maybe if we do something where we clearly have no idea what we're doing and just meander desperately for storylines. No? All right. Well, why don't we do what DS9 actually did and try to do a uniquely DS9 story? This is the first three-parter in Star Trek history, and it's deliberately done... Well, <clears throat> it was deliberately done to be a uniquely Deep Space Nine story. The idea being, hey, look... We're here, we're established with the Bajorans and the Federation relationship with the Bajorans. Why don't we do a heavy political and cultural story? The kind of story you couldn't really do in most of the other shows, not, not in the strictest sense of the word. So, okay, that's cool. I like that. I like that. So, what we have here is an attempt to really look at the situation and explore and examine... Something that's been, well, not so much a subplot as a background plot for all of season one. Namely the fact that I want you to pitch, picture Bajor's big old kettle. Big old kettle just sitting on the fire. And all of the Bajorans are in the kettle. And they're all just boiling all over the place. And that's basically the situation. Because nobody has any idea what they're doing. I just talked about this back in In the Hands of the Prophets. Where even the religious council, which is basically part of the government, is just going... Because they have no idea what they're doing. Lots of people are getting swept up into the, into the ideals and, and the energy and the passion and the, the ambition and the evil and the good and all the other stuff that comes with state crafting. But nobody has any idea what they're doing. This is also, uh, I just want to say something really quick. I only have one note about him. We'll talk more about him in the next few things. Uh, Mr. Jaro makes his appearance here. One of three appearances he's in this whole three-parter. He was played, I'm sorry, I don't actually know the name of the actor. He's not super important. But he deliberately wanted to go with an uncredited role, which I find very interesting. For those of you not aware, most of the time when a guest star admits to being a full-fledged guest star on a TV show, especially a well-known one like Star Trek, they're doing it to either further their career, you know, basically adding to the resume, or to get some attention to pull them into more of an acting role. He was interested in none of that. He was actually doing it because his kids like Star Trek. I just think that's kind of cool. I don't have anything else to add to that right now. But I want to talk about that three-parter thing. Now, as I've discussed before, the way multi-part episodes in, in television work, basically the budget doesn't work quite the same. And there's some budget shenanigans and some accounting shenanigans. But what it boils down to is hiring a guest star for two episodes is cheaper than hiring a guest star for one episode and hiring a guest star for another episode. That, that's really the basic way of explaining how multi-parters tend to save money, okay? And remember, DS9 was having some budgetary issues. So one of the things they were very interested in starting off with Season 2 is... Why don't we pull back on the budget a bit so we can spend it where we need to? And that is what they ended up doing. They basically ended up splurging uh, later on in the season with stuff that where they felt it would actually be more reasonable. So, good stuff there. Now, it is worth noting that they did have a location shoot in this episode. Those, are, those tend to be pretty expensive. And by all accounts, the place they went to, the craggy, rocky area, was absolutely miserable and terrible to film. It's someplace down in the L.A., <clears throat> down in the L.A. area, and uh, by all accounts, it looks great. It does actually look great. They would reuse that location several times throughout DS9. But by all accounts, it is an absolutely miserable place to act in. So uh, my heart goes out to the actors on that one. Pardon me one moment. So, Quark 
offers to help Odo. Now, what I find funny about this is this is actually a very obvious strategy. He, he, as he says it in the Ferengi Rules of Acquisition, is quite an apt way of put it. Every now and again, declare, pe declare peace. Your opponents have no idea how to deal with that. And that's true. There are plenty of ways to exploit that to your own advantage, but I like how Odo is completely set for a loop by that. It's just a nice little touch that kind of helps to show that Odo doesn't really think in terms of complexity yet. He's still fairly black and white. We also see Rionage for the first time, uh, first of three, I think, times in this episode. She's the woman, uh, I forget the species she is, but she plays the freighter captain, uh, you know, the smuggler type lady. And she'll actually be a semi-recurring, you know, extra type character in several future episodes. That was kind of cool to see her. And then we see the Bajoran earring. I have a very short story to tell you. Please forgive my indulgence, but the first time... Yes, the first time I ever went to a Star Trek convention with my mom. This was quite a while ago. Uh, but obviously this was after Deep Space Nine had... Well, after TNG had been a thing for a while, and after Deep Space Nine had started being a thing. I remember we were going through the booths where they sold stuff, and there was some one booth where this woman had made all of her own Bajoran... Uh, you know, uh, jewelry, including the earrings, of course. Now, I've been to a lot of conventions since, and anybody who's been to conventions could probably tell you there's a lot of different levels of quality. Sometimes you get absolute garbage, which isn't worth track, and then you get stuff that's really, really awesome. In this case, this was really, really awesome. My mother actually still has this earring, this Bajoran-style earring, to this very day. It was very well made, and it looked really awesome. I just wanted to share that, because I've always liked the style of those earrings. It was a gift I bought for her, actually. Um, and then we went to see Brent Spiner, which was kind of cool as well. But anyways, I'm getting off topic. So, I got a question for you. What do you think Quark was expecting, exactly, when he went into Kira's quarters? Like, the way he's portraying it is the, Haha, I'm going to be annoying because it amuses me, but then I've got something you want. But then he never really gets anything out of it, and he never really switches mode. It's just, it's all still the ha ha, you know, kind of a thing. I just felt like that scene fell a little bit flat on its face, more than it otherwise should have. But then again, I also feel pretty bad for Cork in this episode in general, but I'll cover that in a minute. Kira says she needs a runabout to go rescue, you know, I don't actually know his name, <laughs> Legend Guy. They say it several times in the episode. It was never that memorable to me, to be completely blunt. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So, she needs a runabout to go rescue Legend Guy, right? One of her stated reasons for doing so is that she needs a ship that has defenses and uh, maneuverability that is significant enough to be able to avoid Cardassian ships and patrols. Okay? That makes a degree of sense. It also really makes things horrible. Now, I've actually been talking this whole time, pretty much through all of season one, about how, and there's no nice way to say this, how incredibly pathetic the Bajoran fleet capacity is at this point in time. I've even postulated the theory that Bajoran space might not even extend to their entire system. And yet, this really, I shouldn't say and yet, because that implies I'm about to disagree with that. This agrees with that mentality. Remember, runabouts are garbage. They're basically little, they're slightly better shuttles. They're basically long-range shuttles, actually. Now I know, on DS9, they were kind of limited to runabouts for quite a while. But Kira flat-out says that these runabouts are superior to their actual ships. And that's just sad. But it's consistent. It's consistent with Season 1, you know, everything that we've been doing there, and it's consistent with the state of the Bajoran people, infrastructure, fleet, etc., now, really subtle touch. I don't have anything else to say about this, but you notice how Cisco still has that baseball from that terrible episode I don't even remember the name of right now? I just thought I'd point it out. He will continue to have it in the future, as I mentioned back then. So Dax is talking to Cisco about what they're going to do about this situation, and it is Dax who brings up the obvious. In fact, I thought for a moment that this is, of course, this is a perfect Cisco kind of problem. Cisco's very good at playing politics. It's one of the reasons why he is the person who was chosen for this station. Or at least, I'm sorry, I should say, I've always assumed that's one of the reasons he was chosen for this station. The Bajoran situation has always been a political dilemma for the Federation, which is, sounds very callous and very distant, 
but it does speak to the Federation mindset. Now, I'm not casting any aspirations of positivity or negativity here. It is up to you to judge whether you think this sort of political um, influence stretching is a good thing or a bad thing. But this is how the Feds do things. And this episode indicates that. The Cardassians have Bajoran prisoners. Now, the Klingons uh, and the Bajorans and, hell, probably even the Cardassians would send an armed raid team to go rescue them. The Romulans would probably, you know, do something a little more conniving. The Ferengi would try to barter, etc. What would the Feds do? Try to bring obvious, unavoidable evidence of this to light so they could then talk to the Cardassians from a political stance and effectively have manufactured a Cass's belly and then said, hey, so... and basically try to talk down from a war, which the Feds don't actually want, specifically to try and barter this situation away. In other words, the federal, it's the federal approach, the Federation approach is to play at politics. And Dax brings that up. I really wish the episode had concluded on this idea because towards the end, Cisco is having a conversation with Gold Ducat, nice to see him again, and Kira walks in on him. And Gold Ducat says, you know, this, they have been released, the Golden Charge has been punished, you know, this is, this is, again, he even flat out says this is in direct violation of insert code, blah, 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 right? This is unacceptable, we are sorry. Formal apology from the, from the provisional government, etc., etc. Now, I looked at that, and unfortunately, I actually forgot how this went, because my, I was already writing down, I had to scratch out some of my notes, I was writing down, Cisco decided to go ahead and continue with the go-to-bat uh, politically, at, except he didn't. The Federation didn't push that. The Cardassians are the ones who did that of their own volition. The Cardassians were invited to war. They were given a casus belli, a flat-out infiltration and in, in instigation onto their territory by a Bajoran team supported by a Federation individual with, with Federation equipment. And the Cardassians backed off on that one. We'll have to see how that develops in the future. But I really wish they had, they had added in that political side of the Federation, because that is what the Feds do, what the Feds have done, and what the Feds will do in the future. But I digress. There's a bit where Kira is trying to convince Cisco of this, and, she's, and Cisco says, all right, but O'Brien's going with. Now, first of all, I like that. Um... It's worth noting that if she had gone alone, she probably wouldn't have succeeded anywhere near as much, <laughs> if at all. But I also like it because O'Brien is uniquely suited to this. And because, as Cisco points out, this is not just a Bajoran problem. Remember, this is a joint kind of a thing we've got going on here. The Bajorans are not a part of the Federation or Starfleet, but there are a lot of conjoined interests between both parties, between both organizations. Both of them want the same things for many of the same reasons. So, to Cisco, this is a Federation problem in addition to being a Bajoran problem. So it makes perfect sense to make this a joint operation. And, like I said, O'Brien's perfect for this. He's fought the Cardassians, and, well, he's really good in a, in, in a, in a fix, basically. He's probably the most adaptable of the staff he has on hand, not counting frickin' Odo. And as uh, Cisco points out, he's a pretty good pilot, too, if things come to be. Now, with all of that praise, it then makes the bluffing scene, where they're bluffing their way past the guards, a little bit weirder. I'm, I'm talking about the one in space, not the one on the ground. The one on the ground was, was perfect and horrible. I'll talk about that in a second. The one in space was basically padding. Like, I know we've seen the bluffing scene before, but they don't do anything with it. In fact, it's just bizarre how Kira's like, oh, yeah, we're doing this. And then she turns to O'Brien for, like, some assistance. And O'Brien just is like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> what? Come up with something or show some tension or some character dynamic or something. Make it at least entertaining instead of just having her lie her teeth off. And, and I don't know, I, I really felt like that was a misstep. Let's talk about the prostitute thing, um, because there's, there's no nice way to get around that. It, um, gosh, where do I start? 
Let me go ahead and start off by saying that the idea of selling people of any gender uh, as property is the kind of thing that is repugnant and disgusting to me. I, I just, let's just start with from that possession. The idea that the Cardassians have such an established cultural mindset of Bajorans being sexy says things I don't want to really talk about, to be completely blunt. You know what I mean by that? I don't mean the sexy part. I mean, if you have literally decades of certain types of activities happening in your society, your culture, your government, your organization, whatever, those are going to start to form cultural norms. Um, let, me use, uh, let me use something that's a lot less horrible, but still the same type of thing. I was, I was born in California, okay? Nice, normal, boring, ordinary state, or at least when I was born there, which is a little while ago now. Uh, it's got a little bit of a different reputation nowadays. And when I was born there, uh, one of the things that was considered exotic in a very sexy kind of a way was Eastern European women. The idea that just being from there and nothing else was considered appealing. Now, there were reasons for that, mostly due to the fact that we were still pulling ourselves out of the Cold War. And there was this kind of just allure of the, the, the sexy enemy, you know, that kind of a thing. So my point being, thanks to all that we went through, thanks to all of those issues, Russian women in particular, and Eastern European women, because some people can't tell the difference, I can, please don't accuse me of, of calling Eastern European, it's Russian, let's not get into that, <laughs> found that kind of thing culturally to be exotic. And that's the same feel I get here with regards to uh, with regards to the idea of seeing this Bajoran woman and automatically being like, oh yeah, she's totally worth it. I'm not trying to say that Nana Visitor is or is not attractive. I don't think that's actually a factor, and that's my point. I think that's one of the reasons why this kind of ploy would have succeeded pretty much regardless. Also, the guard sees absolutely nothing unusual about a human coming by and peddling a prostitute in a slave camp. So that's another thing to make you uncomfortable. They get in, beat the crap out of him. Oh, that was satisfying. Just, and they try to get legendary guy out, as well as as many people as they can. They get out. You'll notice that he starts getting preferential treatment immediate. The episode's almost too obvious about this because he really does get a lot of preferential treatment. I mean, there's even a scene where all these people who have been in a slave camp are basically being hurried along in the background, and he's being looked over by the station's doctor and then is beamed directly to sickbay. I mean, he's even protesting this as it's happening. I think that speaks for itself, really. So, oh, I, one other quick thing. I just want to say, I'm sorry, before I got to the prostitute thing. It was nice to see that the number of prisoners presented the dilemma. That was actually well written. The idea there being, they went here kind of assuming they'd find one or two or maybe five Bajorans, right? Bzz, beamed up, done, move on. No, there's a whole bunch. And that's the problem because they start beaming people up. And people are going to be aware pretty much instantly, so there's a pretty good chance they're only going to get the one beam up. And they are here for a specific individual, which means they can't risk that, so they have to land. That was a nice way to write around the tech, because they did have the ability to just beam up and cut and run, but they couldn't because of the prize they were after, so nice dilemma. <clears throat> So, uh, there's a scene with Cork and Rom. It's a nice down-to-earth slice-of-life scene. It goes on a little bit too long, a little bit too repetitious. You could feel that this episode was stretched out just a bit. Too many scenes go on just a little bit too long, and that's basically true throughout the entire work. But I did like the down-to-earth perspective on it. We get to see more of Rom. We get to see more of Cork. And then he gets branded by the circle. When I first saw that, my first gut reaction is, why Quark? Of all people to bother to try and make your mark on, what's the point? Well, they don't actually really properly go into the Circle's motivations in this episode. They will in the next two. But we do know one thing about the Circle's motivations. Bajoran supremacy. And yeah, that's always an ugly topic, isn't it? 
I get to talk about so many wonderful things while discussing Deep Space Nine. In other words, Cork is not a Bajoran on a Bajoran station. And let's be honest, he's kind of an easy target. So they mark him to make a point. Get off our land. This is ours. And these people are basically terrorists. These are people who are more than willing to terrorize, to afflict harm upon others in order to get their way. And, as Kira points out, they are more organized than the actual government, which is probably starting to look very appealing to people. I do find one thing very amusing in a horrifically awful kind of a way. Several times it's mentioned in the, this episode that the Bajorans need leadership. They need someone to guide them to the future. Now, obviously, the intent behind that is that they want Legendary Guy to be this shining beacon of hope to help propel the government forward, but... They had leadership. No. They had guidance. They had someone telling them what to do and how to do it and when to do it. They've had that for decades. I just find it very intriguing that, and I don't know if DS9 did this on purpose, that after so relatively recently, within a year of throwing off the yoke of oppression and slavery, that they then clamber about for leadership. Now, I do know there's a difference between a good leader and an oppressive slaver. But what I find interesting is that there's no real movement towards, for example, actual anarchism or uh, free states you know, a city-state, confederacies type situation. I could talk about this more. I'm not going to waste your time. I just, I just find it engaging that they're going that route with it. I'm checking my notes here. Um, it's actually interesting. The circ One other thing I want to mention about the circle is this goes all the way back to past prologue. I kind of mentioned how incredibly stupid it was in past prologue that they were like, we're going to destroy the wormhole and kick everyone off Bajor. Yeah, it'll be great which was incredibly stupid for many reasons, not the least of which the fact that the Cardassians were here before the wormhole. But ignoring that, what I find interesting is that the idea is a little less overall stupid now because it's been a year. Not just a year to simmer, a year to boil. You remember that analogy? That, that metaphor, the visual metaphor I mentioned earlier, the boiling pot? Because the Bajoran people have no idea what they're doing. I, I, my heart goes out to these people. It really does. I, I can't even begin to imagine what they've been through. You know, the idea of just, ah, ah, okay, it's over. Let's go. Let's make something new. And, and everyone's just pulling in a dozen different directions. This is what's right here. This is what FF10-2 should have been. Um, <laughs> I love it. It's just kind of horrible at the same time. And there's another little tidbit they do, which is kind of nice. There's this little tidbit with Jake wanting to go out on a date with a Bajoran girl. Now... I hate flirting and all romance and all love and think we should all be robots, but <laughs> but it's a nice way to re-emphasize the point in a minor, quiet, subtle sort of a way. Not, not subtle, that's the wrong word. Um, Non-impacting. Oh no, he doesn't get to date some girl we've never heard of before. Well, that's not the point. The point is he doesn't get to go on his first date because there are Bajorans who are starting to be, well, Bajoran supremacists. People who are try starting to say that Bajor should be for Bajorans, and there should be no interaction between Bajorans and non-Bajorans, and all of the gluch that comes along with that. I do kind of like that perspective, because you, you can't tell me there wouldn't be people thinking that, or at least leaning in that direction. So there's the fake legend thing. You know, woo, the fake legend thing. Um, he admits his fake legend. I kind of like their take on this. Too often, the fake legend in fiction is, I am this great, wonderful person in legend, but in reality, I'm this horribly scummy person, right? But here we have a guy who isn't actually that bad. I mean, he's another resistance fighter, just like the rest of them, and he got arrested just like the rest of them. The, but he does understand the magnitude of his legend. He does care about his people. He is willing to stand up on the promenade and give that speech. He is willing to comprehend the, the nature of what he means to these people, willing to be a symbol, not because he is that person he ascribes to be, but because he understands the need for it. Now, 
That being said, it is then very logical that he wanted to run away. Because he's not a legend, he's just some other guy who happened to also be a resistance fighter. And a resistance fighter doesn't want that job. But you'll also notice that it takes very little prodding for him to accept that job. Because he already knew all this stuff. It's a nice way to make him not too far one way and not too far the other. A very human character, and I do like his presentation. And I swear I'll write down his, his name for the next episode, because then the episode just kind of ends out of nowhere. You know how I know I'm engaged with an episode, or bored with an episode? It's, admittedly, both have the same reaction. The episode ends, and I'm like, oh, what, it's over? It's already been 44 minutes or whatever, right? That's kind of what I had here. It's like he is being, what was it? He's being named Navak. That's it. He's being named Navak and he's replacing Kira. Da, 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 to be continued. I kind of like that. In this case, I think it was both engaging and boring. The political situation was awesome. The rest of it was actually quite boring. I really wish they did more with this. This could have been an amazing episode. Instead, I would say this is a merely average episode. But we will see how they continue this arc and conclude it in the next two episodes, which I will be seeing you guys with next time.